Hello. When we watched the changing skylines of the City of London, we sometimes looked across to St Paul's from the opposite side of the river. And that's where we shall be today, on the south side of the bank of the Thames. Three hundred years ago, Christopher Wren lived here while he was supervising the rebuilding of St. Paul's and the city churches. From his house, he could look over the river and watch work being done on the domes. The house is still standing. Alan and I read the plaque on the wall. We looked along Bankside, over the river, and towards the city. We watched an oil tanker, its funnel down to pass under London Bridge, and any lower bridges further upstream. These tankers bring oil to the power stations along the river. And one of these is Bankside, opposite St Paul's, here. So when we come along Sumner Street, we see the power station itself. White smoke from the tall stack a great brick building. Inside is the huge turbine hall where the electricity is made. It's all very clean and still, just the steady throb of the turbines as the electricity is made. Upstairs, men watch the dials and work the switches which control the machinery. It's not like a factory. You can't see the electricity being made, or as we say, generated. So perhaps this diagram will help to explain things to you. The oil is fired to heat water in a huge boiler. The water becomes steam, which drives along pipes to the turbines. The push of the steam drives a shaft in the turbine at great speed. This turns the rotor, a magnet, to generate electricity. Then current can be sent either underground or overhead to our homes, schools and shops. It can be used for your electric fires or lights. This electricity may come from Bankside. Then Alan and I went by lift down under the turbine halls to the tunnel beneath, which leads to the river. This tunnel is very long and narrow, 
and on the right wall is a large pipe carrying oil into the power station. We came up another lift and find ourselves on the jetty. We were in time to watch a tanker tie up, ready to unload its cargo of oil. So you see, there's one good reason for building a power station here by the river. There must be oil or coal to heat the boilers. And there's another reason. The steam for the turbines must be cooled and returned to the boiler. And the smoke we saw coming from the stack must be washed clean and white. So Bankside uses a lot of water, which is pumped in from the river. The entrance to the pipe, through which the water is drawn, is covered with a grid. You can imagine how the leaves and rubbish would prevent the water from getting in. So they call on Mr Bryant and his men to clear it all away. What happens when you get a call from Bankside? Well, I arrange for the divers to go there at the next suitable low water. I also arrange for their equipment to be taken to the station, either by lorry or by boat, depending on where it has to come from. The divers then go out to the jetty and use the jetty man's hut, which is warm and dry, to dress in. Then they start putting on their gear? They say put on their gear. As you see, uh, Dennis the diver is wearing his suit with on, on top a brass collar or corslet. Bill has just tightened up the last of the nuts which hold the the corslet tight to the suit so that no water can get in. He is putting on the diver's lifeline, which the diver uses either to signal to his linesman, to Bill, or in an emergency for Bill to pull him up to the surface should he get um, into difficulties. Dennis is now putting on his belt and there you can just see his knife and no diver will ever go below water without his knife. You can use it for cutting things or as a chisel or even as a saw sometimes. Bill is now putting on one of Dennis's heavy boots, they were heavy brass soles, and they're made particularly heavy. You couldn't normally walk in them, so that the diver stays upright in the water. Without this weight on his feet, he turn upside down. The weights are going on over Dennis's head. And these also help him to stay below the surface of the water. With the air in his suit, he would float to the surface without these weights. And then he is ready for his helmet. Hello, Dennis. Hello. What's this? Made of? Oh, the suit is made of uh, two layers of tan twill with a layer of Indian rubber in between. I the twill. See. Is it quite waterproof? Oh, yes, definitely waterproof. The only time uh, you get any leaks or any uh, water uh, entering the suit is either through your cuffs when you get more pressure in your cuffs and it blows the cuffs, which is the weakest part of your suit, 
and when you get a leak and that's another time you get water in and uh, we normally patch these leaks like uh, any young boy does patching his own bicycle tire Lovely. and this is the diver's helmet the air comes through this pipe here into the helmet so the diver can breathe it and that it comes out through this valve here which is adjusted so that always the air in the helmet is slightly higher pressure than the water outside so that the air helps to keep the water out of his suit. The diver can adjust this valve if he goes into deep, very deep water he wants more air therefore he closes this valve to let less air escape. If he wishes to rise in the water he can fill his suit with air by either closing this valve with the wheel or pressing this knob here. If he wants to let air out quickly to sink he can open this spit cock here which lets the air out very quickly. This connection here is for a telephone which is connected through a wire to the surface to his linesman and the diver can then give instructions by telephone instead of signalling with his lifeline. If he wishes to speak on the telephone he has this little switch here which he presses with his chin. The air to the diver is fed either from a hand pump which two men turn or more usually nowadays through a petrol driven compressor and the air goes through that filter there to make the air clean and fresh for the diver through this pipe to what we call the diver's panel. These gauges tell the man on the surface how much air the diver is getting and if he is getting enough air for the depth at which he's working. The air goes through that valve there which can control the air to the diver down this pipe there and through into the diver's helmet there. Bill puts the helmet on, on Dennis's corslet, screws it on, and now he is ready to dive. As you see, the diver is now standing on the ladder on the diving boat, ready to go in the water, and the linesman is putting his helmet on. The diver can't quite make up his mind if he wants a little more air or a little less. Linesman taps his helmet to tell him that everything is ready to go down. There he is adjusting his air valve. Down he goes. You can see his air bubbles rising to the surface. That way the diver, the linesman can tell just whereabouts his diver is. There the diver is coming up again. Just opened his air valve fully to let the air out of his suit. The 
the linesman takes his helmet off. There's the boat with two divers with their suits on, ready to go to work. There go the divers. To take off their suits and equipment and to get warm and dry. I noticed you weren't wearing gloves in the film. No, on this uh, occasion we don't uh, require gloves. The only time you require gloves is when you're diving in extreme cold water or when you're underwater cutting and welding and also when you're working on wrecks uh, where there's jagged metal and barnacles. That's the only time we wear them. I suppose you have to feel your way about because you can't see no, very much No, you can't see. Underwater. It's all it's all done by touch, it is. especially in the Thames. Mm. I suppose there's other work for divers along the riverside. Oh, yes. Yeah. There's underwater repairs to jetties and wharves or demolition of them or lifting of wrecks or recovering lost cargo. Can you work at any time that you're asked to? No, it's dependent on the tide in most places. Um, a diver can only work in if the water is flowing at up to about two miles an hour comfortably. Have you ever found anything interesting at the bottom of the river? Yes, I have. I remember one instance at um, Blackfriars Bridge, I was diving there, doing some repair work, and after I finished the job, I thought to myself, well, I might as well have a stroll on the bottom of the river and see what I can find, because being London's a very old city and as I was walking around I bumped into this cylindrical object as I felt around again I felt a socket in the side and I thought well this seems funny so I came up I surfaced and said to my second diver go down and have a look what I found and I said for goodness sake don't kick it <laughs> then he was down there about two or three seconds and up <laughs> he popped you know and his face was white yeah. he said you clot you found a bomb you know <laughs> Gosh. and uh, and from there, it confirmed my story. We had found a bomb, and then I reported it to the river police. This could have been very dangerous, oh, it couldn't could have it, been, if you hadn't it found was, it? Yes, because it was right in the shipping lanes. And so a ship could have touched it and then yes, and been blown up completely? Yes, and also Blackfriars Bridge. Of course, yes. Mm. Do you ever find anything old, Phil, at the bottom of the river? Anything that's been lying there Not for years? Not usually. Um, you've got to remember that the River Thames, as we know it, is much narrower than it was hundreds of years ago and that the places where people would have thrown away the rubbish, that is, outside their own front doors, have all been built over recent, recently, or fairly recently. And you only find um, anything of interest or value if you're dredging or actually excavating in the bottom of the riverbed. So, in fact, it's probably builders that find the exciting things and builders not the divers. Builders engineers, yes. <laughs> well, Let's imagine that they did find some treasure in a chest right at the bottom of the river. They opened the chest and they found some weapons, swords and pistols. They were very excited about it, of course, so they phoned up the television cameramen and the newspaper reportermen and they told them to come down and they all brought their equipment and... Well, let's leave that till next week, shall we? Goodbye for now. <laughs>